perfect. Hello everybody, how's everybody doing? Uh, what, this is going to be a brand new series, right, on cardiac. Um, first, first topic we're going to be starting off with is hypertension. Um, what, I'm, what I'm going to be doing down the line is pretty much breaking down uh, these topics such as hypertension, myocardial infarctions, coronary artery disease, etc., etc., into subgroups, right? So we're going to be talking about the pathophysiology behind it. We're going to be talking about some nursing interventions that could be provided to, to, to the patient, some diagnostic testing, and some medications such as contraindications, things to look out for. So let's go ahead and get started. So the pathophysiology behind hypertension. So it's important to understand what hypertension is, right? So let's define it. So hypertension is the amount of blood that's pushing against an arterial wall. Hypertension could be caused by under, underlying diseases such, you know, such as diabetes, for example. Um, that's, that goes unregulated after a while. Um, a poor diet, you know, et cetera, such as things, anything that's going to increase that blood pressure is what we're pretty much talking about in this video. So for example, it's important to understand the formula behind hypertension um, to understand how it increases, how, you know, how blood pressure will increase over time. So blood pressure is a uh, stroke, um, <clears throat> blood pressure is peripheral vascular resistance times cardiac output. Now we've got to ask ourselves, what's going to increase that peripheral vascular resistance? Well, pretty much peripheral vascular resistance is going to increase due to a narrowing of the, of the arterial wall, such as atherosclerosis over a period of time. Um, someone who's not as healthy as a normal individual and takes in a high cholesterol, you know, high cholesterol diet, for example, you know, the, the lipid is going to stick onto that arterial wall and later on it's going to, that, that artery is going to atherosclerose, cause a narrowing and therefore it's going to increase that peripheral vascular resistance. Now, what's going to increase cardiac output? Um, well, cardiac output is due to, uh, it's going to increase due to a high blood volume, right? So, um, for example, going back to the diet, taking in a, taking in a, um, a diet that is, you know, high in sodium and where, you know, where you're going to be pretty much, uh, gaining excess water weight because wherever sodium goes, water is going to follow. And then, a compensatory mechanism such as RAS is also going to increase your cardiac cardiac output due to due to the release of aldosterone, re, uh, you know, uh, retaining that sodium and water, therefore increasing your blood pressure. How is a poor diet going to increase your blood pressure? So you're pretty much going to a fast food restaurant all the time. Um, you know, you're taking in that you know that that fatty, salty cheeseburger all the time. You know, it's going to retain that sodium. Wherever sodium goes, water is going to follow. So pretty much uh, what that's gonna do over time, it's gonna increase your blood pressure, you know, high cholesterol content, you know, it's gonna, you know, if, if it's not regulated correctly, it could lead to atherosclerosis. Um, so another way your blood pressure could increase is, you know, by three compensatory mechanisms that our body could go through. Um, it, for example, the first one is and the antidiuretic hormone, you know, that's released. Um, another, Another compensatory mechanism is the sympathetic nervous system, right? Uh, you know, that's your fight or flight. Uh, so how would that increase your blood pressure? Well, first off, your, your blood pressure is going to be increased due to a... Um, <clears throat> the sympathetic nervous system is going to allow the adrenal medulla to release your catecholamines, such as norepinephrine, epinephrine. You know, therefore, it's going to increase your heart rate, increase your blood pressure. Then the RAS, right? RAS, I'm gonna have a whole separate video on RAS, um, but I'll give you a, a, you know, just a quick breakdown of it. So pretty much, RAS, what's gonna happen is that um, aldosterone is, gonna be, is going to be released, right? And aldosterone, what it's gonna do is that it's gonna retain that sodium, it's gonna retain that water, right? And that you also have angiotensin II, which is a potent vasoconstrictor, and it's going to clamp down on all your vessels, um, and therefore increase your blood pressure. So there, those are just some ways how blood pressure is going to increase. Um, so there's some important components of the cardiovascular system that's you know, worth noting, right? Uh, first one that we should talk about is blood. 
Um, so blood, uh, what's you know the function of blood? It's, it's to contain. It carries oxygen. Blood is bro broken down into three components. So let's go this way. Blood is broken down to three components. All right. First component is heme. Second component is globin. Third component is iron. So, um, so pretty much, you know, the importance of it is that it's going to contain that oxygen uh, in order for you to perfuse the rest of your body. Now, coming back, um, <clears throat> coming back, the cardiovascular system. Is also com is also composed of your blood vessels, right? So the blood vessel, the function it is to you know carry that oxygenated blood to the rest, you know, to to your uh, to, you know to your organs, to your tissues, to maintain proper cardiac output and perfuse your tissues. Um, blood vessels, like it's your blood vessels, are a umbrella term, right? So it's going to be broken down into arteries and veins so what are some important you know what are some characteristics of arteries well are strong big and muscular why is it strong big and muscular right it's because it contains because it's highly pressurized it's supposed to carry it's a, it's supposed to hold a lot of blood content in order to get that blood uh away from the heart right if it um away from the heart to your organ systems because that's the you know that's the importance of artery. It carries blood away from your heart. Um, veins, on the other hand, are some characteristics behind it. It's elastic, and it's one way. It's it's a, it's a one way system, and it and the only way for for blood to go back to your heart is with the use of valves. Um, but it won't work by itself. So how would, so it's due to veins being a low pressurized system, we need something to help that blood travel back from, uh, that's inside your veins back to the heart. So that's the use of skeletal muscle. Every time the skeletal muscle contracts, it's going to send blood from the veins back to your heart with a valve, right? With, with the help of the valves. So let's see. Here are our veins, right here. And here are our valves. And since it's low, you know, since it's low pressurized, it's not gonna be able to, to get that blood back to the heart by itself. It's going to need a helper, and that's gonna be skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is gonna get that blood back to the heart by contracting. So for example, if I'm, if I'm going for a walk, I'm using my calf muscles, you know, that's gonna contain some skeletal muscle in it, and it's gonna pump that Pump that you know, pump the vein, uh, pump the blood inside my veins back to the heart. Okay, and then a third component is the heart. You know, that's the third component of the cardiovascular system. The heart's job is just a pump. That's it. You know, we, we want to maintain uh, systemic blood flow, and that's going to help it. These three components is going to pretty much maintain cardiac output. It's kind of you know, it's really important to understand that our body is always trying to compensate for itself. So, for example, everything in our body is, is trying to maintain cardiac output. So if you think of platelets, for example, that's, that's going to maintain cardiac output. Why? Because platelets have a mechanism of hemostasis, right? If platelets are going, you know, platelets are going to aggregate onto, um, you know, damaged blood vessels, and it's going to occlude that it's going to occlude a site that's damaged. And that's the platelet's job of maintaining cardiac output. How about white blood cells? Well, white blood cells, on the other hand, uh, maintains cardiac output is by using vasodilation, right? Vasodilation is going to, um, it's going to uh, vasodilate the, you know, the blood vessels with the use of, you know, some cytokines such as Histamine, for example, right? That's going to cause vasodilation. And that's going to maintain cardi uh, cardiac output. 
okay, so we have all those components. Now what if a patient has low cardiac output? Well, if a patient has low cardiac output, you're also gonna have low tissue perfusion. Why, well, why is that an issue? Well, the reason it's problematic is because all of our cells, all of our cells go through a, me uh, a metabolism called aerobic metabolism. So there's our artery, Here's our veins, All right, and here's our cell. Okay, so our artery, it's going to send out oxygenated blood to our cells. It's going to send out oxygen, O2, oxygenated blood to our cells, and it's going to perfuse it pretty much. Now, what, what's going to happen is that veins, on the other hand, are going to kick off a byproduct, a byproduct called carbon dioxide, CO2. So this is uh, this is the way we, this is the way our tissue is being perfused. Now, what happens if everything goes wrong? One of these systems aren't working correctly. Well, let's go ahead and talk about that. Later. If our cells are not being oxygenated correctly, right? And it's um, due to one of these being damaged, like the blood or the blood vessel, you know, like something went wrong in our cardiovascular system components, right? Um, so what's gonna happen is that our cells are gonna switch from aerobic metabolism, aerobic metabolism, to anaerobic metabolism. Well, why is that an issue right there? Well, the byproduct of an an of anaerobic metabolism is lactic acid. Is lactic acid, right? Why, well, why is lactic acid an issue? Well, um, the buildup of lactic acid, it's going to cause pain. And it can even lead into certain dysrhythmias too, like such as like ventricular tachycardia, V-fib, you know, and that can be deadly. So we don't want our cells to switch from aerobic to anaerobic. Our, our body needs to be, you know, maintain that tissue perfusion all the time, have good cardiac output, have good tissue perfusion. Now there's different types of hypertension. There's primary hypertension and secondary hypertension. Primary hypertension, there's non-modifiable and modifiable. Um, some non some non-modifiable, for example, genetics, genetics, race, um, age. Right? We can't change that. That you know we're stuck with that. Modifiable, for example, are going to be your diet, smoking, alcohol, drink, you know, drinking alcohol, um, etc., etc. Okay, so th that's considered to be primary hypertension. Secondary hypertension. Secondary hypertension is caused by a sec or like a, a disorder, right? So that's why it's called secondary. It's secondary to a disease process. For example. Uh, renal disease, right? Renal disease is a cause of secondary hypertension. Why? So the first one is renal disease. Um, there's an acronym called A wet bed. A wet bed. Okay. This acronym is pretty much the function of the of the kidneys. Um, so the function of the kidneys is acid removal, water balance, electrolyte balance, um, toxin removal. 
blood pressure regulation, and erythropoiesis. And D is um, vitamin D, tr the transfer of vitamin D. Right? Now, if any of these are damaged, our kidney's not gonna work. Therefore, blood pressure is going to increase. Okay, a second reason. Um, <clears throat> endocrine disorders, right? So there's some endocrine disorders that can cause secondary hypertension. For example, diabetes. Third example, pheochromocytoma. Fourth example, Cushing syndrome. Cushing's. Diabetes, you know, over time, if it goes unregulated, it's going to increase the amount of um, sugar in the body, and it's going to, you know, uh, kind of mess up, you know, mess up your blood pressure over, over time. Uh, pheochromocytoma, what that is, it's a tumor on the um, adrenal medulla that's going to just keep on sending out epinephrine or epinephrine, therefore increasing your heart rate, increasing your blood pressure. We don't want that to happen. All right, so the results of low tissue perfusion are going to affect different organ systems such as the skin, GI, cardiovascular system, the CNS, okay, and so, the renal system. Uh, um, another reason why hypertension could increase that's worth mentioning is the discussion of how the capillary systems could be damaged, right? This is another way of how blood pressure could increase. So let me explain. The left ventricle is pushing out blood normally with a normal adult at a rate of 120 over 80. Okay. And as you know, it's pushed out through the left ventricle to the aortic valve and to the aorta systemic. Now it goes out systemic. Now what happens if you take an adult that isn't the healthiest, that is unhealthy, let's say it has a blood pressure of 160, over 100, right? Let's just say that. High blood pressure, same situation. Left ventricle is gonna push out blood to the aorta, it's gonna go through the, the aortic valve into the aorta, and then this is where it gets interesting. Blood, so blood is pushed out from the left ventricle through the aortic valve to the aorta. The blood from the aorta is going to be sent to your arterioles. So normally the, the function of the arterioles is to put a halt on that blood pressure, right? It's supposed to slow down that blood pressure as soon as it gets to the, your arterioles. So by the time it gets to your arteries, it's not gonna be damaging it, right? But at this rate, it's not gonna keep up with it. So blood is going to be keep on, you know, it's going to be sent to your arteries at, still at a rate of 160 over 80 over time and then that blood is going to then be sent from your arteries to your capillary system. So here's your capillary system, right? So over a time and over time and over time, what's going to happen that high blood pressure is going to cause your capillaries, your capillary system to leak, right? So now you have fluid leaking out because that's the way your body's going to compensate. So blood pressure is going to increase due because due to high fluid content in that area. Okay, so some assessment skills to do for a patient um, that has hypertension. Well, the, we can kind of break it down to subjective, objective. Subjective, we kind of want to know, after a prolonged period of time of having hypertension, are there any organ system that's damaged? So we can, uh, ask them about certain things, right? So we can ask them about, for example, let's start off with the neuro. Do you have a headache? Um, do they have any slurred speech, any weakness? Uh, do they have any weakness in their, uh, you know, in their extremities? Or do they have ataxia, for example? Retinopathy, their eyes, right? Do they, do they have any blurry vision? Um, any vision changes, anything like that? Uh, cardiovascular system, on the other hand, <clears throat> do they have any distended neck veins? 
Um, you know, is, is their heart rate increased? Uh, you know, what's their blood pressure like? Obviously, it's going to be high in this case. Um, renal function, you want to monitor for urine output. You know, normal urine output is, you know, it's supposed to be great, greater than 30. 30 cc's. You want, you want to monitor that. You know, we want to measure, you know, if they have a folian, for example, you want to measure all the, con you know, all the urine output and chart it as much as possible. Um, some objective things that you can do, for example, well, um, just, you know, do some simple vitals, you know, take their heart rate, um, check their blood pressure, you know, just do, do, the, do the whole shebang, O2, heart rate, blood pressure, check all that. Auscultation, let's auscultate. Is S1 loudest at the apex? Is S2 loudest at the base? You know, switch, switch to the bell. Do they have any murmurs at S3, S4? EKG, what, what's, what's their strips looking like? Is it normal? Is a normal sinus rhythm? You know, is it irregular? What is it? I'm gonna have a whole separate video on EKGs, so we'll talk about that a little bit more. Okay, so some diagnostics for hypertension. Uh, some diagnostic testing that could be ordered for a patient with hypertension is a urinalysis, BUN creatinine, cholesterol, and a CBC with a differential. So why would a why would a urinalysis be ordered, right? Well, over time, when, when someone uh, when a patient has high blood pressure, and that high velocity of blood is keeps on banging up the kidneys over time and over time, renal function is going to decrease. Um, so you know the kidney has, you know the kidney is, has a function to maintain and hold onto valuable. Uh, valuable concepts such as like white blood cells, red blood cells, and protein. So it's ordered for renal function. Detect renal function. Findings: uh, You'll have a, you know, a positive. Uh, you'll have a, a increased amount of red blood cells in your urine, which. Is always always a bad sign. White blood cells, protein. Um, we don't want that. You know, we don't want we don't want to see that in a patient's urine. Um, okay, how about B one creatinine? Same thing. We want to detect renal function, right? So the so detect renal function. What are some findings that you will find? Well, you're gonna have you're gonna find a an elevated B one. Elevated creatinine. The normal value for BUN in creatinine. BUN is you know it ranges from eight to twenty. And creatinine ranges from zero point six to one point two. Why would a cholesterol test be ordered? Well, first off, it's because we want to detect hyperlipidemia. That's the biggest you know that's the biggest reason. Um, why would a patient have high cholesterol? Well, over time, poor diet, you know, the high lipid content is gonna stick onto the arterial walls and aggregate, you know, lead to atherosclerosis, you know, lead to a narrowing of the arteries, hypertension. Um, so what are some findings? Obviously it's gonna be high cholesterol, right? What, is, what are the, uh, the normals for total cholesterol? Anything less than 200, triglycerides, anything less than 150, LDL, anything less than 100, and HDL, anything greater than 40. Um, CBC with differential. Uh, why would that be ordered? Well, the main reason is to detect anemia. We understand that uh, you know, red blood cells contain three components, iron, globin, heme. Uh, hemoglobin is what contains the oxygen, is what actually maintains the tissue perfusion, right? Um, so what are some findings? Um, Anemia is the biggest thing that you would see with a CBC with differential. Um, you know, a low hemoglobin, low hematocrit. So for the farm, for the pharmacology and the treatments for hypertension, um, it's you know it's very important to start off. You know, patient comes in, you know, uh, wants to get rid of this hypertension. What should you do? You should always offer the non-pharmacological method first, right? Um, 
you know, always educate them about that. Teach them, okay, well, let's try to bring down this blood pressure by, let's try a, a new diet, let's try exercising, let's, you know, let's, let's get this weight off and let's get your blood pressure down as much as possible before we have to initiate any pharmacological methods, right? Um, so patient, let's say, let's say patient comes in a few months later, nothing has changed. We're, you know, most likely doctors probably most likely going to put them on a, uh, put them on a medication, right? Typically first medication that they're going to put them on ACE inhibitors. Why? Why would, why would, uh, you know, why would a, you know, a physician order a, an ACE inhibitor first? Well, Medications such as enalapril, uh, anything that ends in pro, right? That's an ACE inhibitor. Um, so what the action is, it's going to stop the conversion from angiotensin one to angiotensin two by blocking an enzyme called ACE that's converted in the lungs. Um, so what are some side effects of an ACE inhibitor? Well, um, Actually, it's kind of easy as a matter of fact. A, C, E, angioedema, cough, and elevated potassium. What's, what's considered elevated potassium? Well, normal potassium is from 3.5 to, to 5. That's considered normal potassium, right? Um, so what are some nurse, you know, what are some educational tips you want to give this patient? Well, avoid foods, high potassium, you know, spinach, potatoes, raisin, yogurt, tomatoes, avoid those bananas. Let's, let's stay away from those. Okay. So how about, uh, ARBs, right? Anything that ends in sartin, like low sartin, um, it's action and mechanism is going to act on angiotensin two, right? Angiotensin two is considered a potent vasoconstrictor so it you know it's going to work on a different part of the res system the compensatory system um, it just pretty much acts on a different area of that system um, side effects is very similar to ACE inhibitors except they're not going to have a cough so also avoid foods high potassium okay so calcium channel blockers so anything that ends in the pain for example like amlodipine or also anything that ends in like Zem, like Viltiazem, Cardazem, those are considered to be calcium channel blockers. Its mechanism, its mechanism action is what that's going to do. It's going to pretty much, it literally blocks calcium receptors, right? So it's going to block calcium from absorbing into smooth muscle. So initially, or ultimately, what it's going to do is going to cause smooth muscle relaxation. Therefore, side effect, it's going to cause vasodilation. So what are some nursing interventions you would want to mention to a patient, especially an elderly patient who's trying to get out of bed? Well, let's talk to them and be like, hey, before you get out of bed, make sure you hit that call button and I'll come in and I'll bring you to the bathroom. Why do we want to do that? Well, it's because if they get up fast enough, they can potentially fall and you know they're, they're going to be a, a huge fall hazard. Vasodilation, low blood pressure, easy fall risk. Um, also, it's, all, it's also important to mention to them, hey, you know, make sure not to drink any grapefruit juice uh, with a calcium channel blocker because technically it will uh, either deactivate the, the medication and it won't work as properly as, um, as they would want it. Um, okay, beta blockers. Um, so anything that ends in olol, like propranolol, metoprolol. Um, it's mechanism act it's mechanism of action what that's going to do it's going to pretty much it acts in two two different systems right it acts in the beta 1 receptors and beta 2 receptors depending on the medication there's different types of medication that's non-selective and selective um, so if it's if a medic if a beta blocker is considered non-selective um, it's going to either work on the beta 1 receptor or beta 2 receptor um, so why is that significant? Well, what, what if you have a patient who has, you know, severely asthmatic and is taking a beta blocker? Well, you kind of want to contact the doctor to see if you can, we can change that beta blocker because if it's a non-selective beta blocker, it's going to activate the beta 2 receptors and it's going to 
cause bronchoconstriction of your bronchial, of the patient's bronchioles, and it's gonna pretty much close their airway. Okay, so what if a patient is diabetic, right? A beta blocker, you know, a beta blocker could be a tough medication to give because uh, what it could do is that it can mask hypoglycemia. So it can, you know, if a patient's hypoglycemic and has is tachycardic, is, you know, has a high heart rate, diaphoretic, you know, dizzy, it's gonna mask those symptoms and they won't know that they're hypoglycemic. So that's probably not the best medication to give for someone who is, you know, a type one diabetic, type two diabetic. So what's important about diuretics? So we have furosemide, also known as Lasix, and we have spironolactone. Furosemide, uh, when you're, <clears throat> these, these medications, they're, um, they work in the loop of Henle and uh, what it does, the, you know, depends where in the loop of Henle, but it's mechanism of actions that they want to get rid of any extra urine content that the patient may be holding. So they're gonna be, they're, they're gonna diurese all that content. Something important about furosemide is that um, when you're pushing it IV push, you want to push it slow so they don't lose their hearing. Um, also, when you're when you're looking through the you know through your patient's medication in the morning or you know in the evening, depending what shift you're, you're working, it's important to know what kind of uh, it's important to know if they have a potassium supplement with their with their Lasix because furosemide is gonna get rid of potassium, right? And it's important for you, for you to mention to the doctor or the, you know, or the physician um, to get them a potassium supplement so their uh, potassium levels can be maintained. Spironolactone, it's potassium sparing. Um, so we don't really need to worry too much about the potassium but you know it's it's very you know it's always important to keep an eye on all your all the patient's electrolytes. Um, so some side effects: low blood pressure. Um, so you know it's, it's very important to educate them about getting out of bed and calling you if they need to get out, um, so they don't fall and hurt themselves. All right, so this is a question that I developed on my own. So go ahead, pause the video, read it, answer it, and the answer will be ready for you. Okay, so another quick question. What foods should a patient taking an ACE inhibitor avoid? We pretty much covered everything about hypertension, going from patho to the nursing interventions to the farm, you know, pharma, you know, the farm treatments. Um, if you like this video, just go ahead, you know, like, share, and if you haven't subscribed, definitely do that. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, that was my first video, and then I'm going to be releasing my next video soon.